If you'd like to turn then to uh, Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 7, and once my eyes begin to get themselves settled down, we can get moving. I must have had them shut too tight. Luke chapter 7, and I'm only going to read a couple of verses there. Luke chapter 7, verse 47. Well, let's read verse 39, because we are going to be thinking about that verse as well. Verse 39, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake with himself, that is, he saw the woman coming to anoint Jesus with ointment. When he saw it, he spake within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of women this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Verse 47, Jesus is speaking, he says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. And we'll only be looking at a couple of those verses. The title tonight, if you want one, is what we read in verse 48. Thy sins are forgiven. Different people uh, see things differently, whether it be events or other people. We can witness the same event and have a different opinion of what happened. And it's the same with people. We have different opinions of individuals. And we see that in this passage tonight, these verses that we've, we've read tonight. Um, the Pharisee had one opinion, and Jesus had another opinion. And of course, uh, the Pharisee was wrong. <laughs> the Pharisee was mistaken. And that's what we notice when we begin to think of the verses that we read. In verse 39, we, we see that the error of the Pharisee was a, a twofold error, if you like. In verse 39, now when the Pharisee which had bidden Jesus saw the woman touching him, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And the first, the first uh, part of the Pharisee's mistake is that he had a wrong opinion or a wrong view of this woman's sin and sin in general. He had a wrong view. In the opinion of the Pharisee, this woman's sinfulness should have been a barrier to her coming close to Jesus Christ, let alone laying her hands on him as she anointed him with oil. The sin of this woman should have been such that it was a barrier stopping her from being accepted by Jesus Christ. Of course, as he says this within himself about the woman, what he's also saying is, because he's sitting at the table or reclining at the table with Christ, at the same time as he's saying this woman's a sinner, he's saying, but no me. I'm not a sinner. You see, I'm sitting next to Jesus. Jesus is in my house at my table. She's a sinner. I'm not a sinner. Blind. Here is someone that should have been an expert in the law, someone that should have known the law of God, should have known the Old Testament teaching, but he seems to be blind to the Old Testament teaching. I'm going to read these verses because they are so important. Genesis chapter 6. 
in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's what God says about the heart of man. The heart of man is wicked, coming up with evil intentions all of the time. The Pharisee should have known this. And so he shouldn't have been able to say within himself, she's a sinner, <coughs> implying that I'm no a sinner. He should have known what God saw in the heart of men. And then in Ecclesiastes 7.20, we're told that there is no one, no one who has not sinned. <coughs> the Pharisee should have known that. Simon should have known that. <coughs> Yet here he is saying, she's a sinner. Simon, so are you. And then, of course, we're told in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, that the heart of man is deceitful beyond even understanding. And that's applicable to every single human being. And so this Pharisee should have known that this woman may be a sinner, but she's no greater a sinner than me. But he viewed her sin wrongly. He had the wrong opinion of her. Jesus says something really significant in verse 47, speaking about this woman, and he, he, he says, her sins, which are many, these many sins of this woman, perhaps they were more public than the sins of the Pharisee, because, of course, the implication with this woman is that she was a prostitute and her sins would have been more public. Public knowledge, maybe the Pharisees' sins were secret, but both were sinners because sin has touched absolutely everyone. That was his first error, the first part of his error. The second part of Simon's error was that not only did he have the wrong view of sin and this woman's sin, he had the wrong view of Jesus. He had a completely wrong opinion of the Lord Jesus Christ. He assumed that if Jesus were a prophet or a holy man, he would have known that this woman was a sinner. And far from allowing her to touch him, he would have chastised her. He would have condemned her, denounced her as a sinner. Wrong view of Christ. This woman was going to be thankful, wasn't she? So are we tonight. We are thankful that Jesus Christ was nothing like the Pharisee. Nothing like what the Pharisee assumed. And so Jesus corrects Simon's wrong thinking. As already noted, he acknowledged that this woman was a sinner. He didn't deny that her sins were many. Um, but he informs Simon that our sins, though they are many, have all been forgiven. Praise the Lord. Yeah, no wonder she was overjoyed at this. But imagine the shock in the heart of Simon the Pharisee. Imagine how he must have felt, this legalist, when even although he was intrigued by Jesus Christ, he was interested in Jesus Christ, maybe even leaning towards Jesus Christ. He had him in his home, after all. He was feeding him. But imagine the shock when 
this man who, as a Pharisee, viewed himself as being separate, separated, holy unto God. When Jesus tells him, it's this woman that's been forgiven, Simon. Simon standing there, think, or reclining there, thinking that he's holy, one of the precious few that God can relate to and who can relate to God. I'm one of the separated ones. That's what the Pharisee means. I'm holy, but the mass of people, the, the rest of them, they're all sinners. They're uneducated. They're ignorant. They are the ones who need to be touched. That just sounds so like the episode where the Pharisee and the publican are praying and, and the Pharisee is boasting in himself that he's thanking God that he's not like this, yet, this guy, he's not like him. Ah, oh, thank God I'm not like him. And the sinner, the publican, is crying out to God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And, and, and Jesus, in Luke 18, verse 14, in that passage, Jesus says to the Pharisee, or he says about the Pharisee, or he says, he implies the shock in the Pharisee by saying it was this man, this publican, who went home justified. It's the same idea here at the table her sins, Simon, have all been forgiven. You cannot tell me her sins. I know them and I know more about them than you do. And I'm telling you that she has been forgiven. Wow. Religion is always shocked by grace. Always. Those who are prideful, they always want to contribute to their salvation, to have an input to their salvation. But when grace denies them the opportunity to boast in that way, wow, they recoil against it. Religion has always done that. Religion always will do that. It will always be offended by grace. And so Jesus puts this Pharisee right. But he isn't, notice, please notice, he is not condemning the Pharisee to the consequences of his religious mindset. He's not condemning the Pharisee to be locked into the consequences of his pride. He's teaching this man, Simon, if you come to me in faith, you too can enter into the clear joy of salvation. That's brilliant. Here we are tonight because that's what we did. Not because we are great, not because we were able, but because he is great and he enabled us. We are no better than anyone else in and of ourselves, but we are in Christ tonight. And so Jesus informs this man that the many sins of the woman has been for, have been forgiven. Yours can be forgiven. Therefore, she loved. 
much. She didn't find forgiveness because she loved, although that's what you could read this and, and think that the woman was forgiven because she loved much. The authorized version kind of lends itself to that. But that's not what it's meant. That's not what is meant. What is meant is that she loved much as a consequence of being forgiven. Oh my goodness me, didn't she love the Lord with all of her heart? But there's one other thing that Jesus did in these verses. Look at verse 48. He said to her, thy sins are forgiven. He said to her, thy sins are forgiven. How beautiful must it have been for this woman to hear those words from the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ had told the Pharisee, her sins are forgiven. He told the Pharisee her sins were forgiven in verse 47. And it seems um, in that same verse that she must have had some spiritual awareness of having been forgiven because she loved much. So she must have sensed it in herself that, that she was forgiven. But now Jesus speaks directly to her and says to her, your sins are forgiven. My goodness me, I think that's marvelous, you see. That's such a loving and affirming thing for the Savior to do. He didn't need to say that to her if she felt it in her spirit. He said it, and he said it publicly. Simon, her sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. A loving thing. I don't know how you feel, but there are times when I need to hear Jesus saying that to me. It's absolutely wonderful to be able to sense within yourself that you're forgiven. It's wonderful to know the spiritual reality of having all of our sins taken care of on the cross. That's wonderful to sense that, to feel that. But how precious is it when we hear the voice of Jesus saying to us, your sins are forgiven. You see, here she is, anointing the Lord, and she's being, Simon is criticizing her within himself. But there were others who would have had the same feelings as Simon articulating it. You'll remember the disciples being angry when the alabaster box was broken and the, the, the ointment was poured upon Christ. What a waste. So right at the moment where she is being criticized, right at the moment when others were looking upon her and she was being made to feel as if she had done something wrong, something displeasing to the Lord, what does he say to her? Your sins are forgiven. Oh, hallelujah. Don't we need that when we're right in the midst of the moment? When we're right at that place where we're feeling that others are criticizing? Maybe we're criticizing ourselves. Maybe we're beating ourselves up. Don't we, don't we find it sweet to hear the voice of Jesus being raised up above every other voice telling us your sins have been forgiven? Oh, it's a marvelous thing when Jesus does this, when we hear these words from the pages of Scripture. It's marvelous when we, we hear the Bible under the power of the Spirit of Christ telling us our sins are forgiven, personally, individually. When through the preacher of the, the gospel, we are told, 
your sins are forgiven. Oh, folks, I want to tell you tonight, Jesus is declaring this over us. And he's declaring it publicly. So whoever is watching in tonight, from wherever it may be, and there are people watching our messages from all over, Jesus is declaring about the group of people who are here in Zion Baptist Church tonight, your sins have been forgiven. He's doing more than declaring it over this group. The Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to you as an individual. And he's saying to you, brother or sister, your sins have been forgiven. Ah, as we come to prayer now, let us love much in our prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, how we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. How we praise you for the reality that we sense within ourselves that we are forgiven. That all of our sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, washed away. Oh, Father, how wonderful that is to know it in our hearts. But we are so grateful tonight, and our love rises up to you tonight, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for telling us. Thank you for telling me your, your sins are forgiven. We love you, Lord, with all of our hearts. May our love be overflowing. May it never cease. May we always be reminded of the greatness of the salvation we have. Blessed Jesus, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for your blood. Thank you that we sit here tonight cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. And it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.